Hello my friends and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 build guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're covering one of the most requested and anticipated topics for my channel, how to build strong parties. So how to build parties that synergize with one another, work well together, and will get you through honor mode or just be a breeze to play the normal game with. This is intended to be a guide to how to think about putting together characters that synergize with one another, which is obviously an incredibly broad topic, and so we will be doing sort of an overview today about the most important considerations, and then I might do deeper dives in the future on specifics that you might want in uh, party building. We'll be talking about sort of the principles of party building, what classes work well together, how to uh, make sure that you're not having conflict with item requirements or skill requirements, which spells are important to have access to in a given party, and I will also be giving some example parties that fill the roles of everything that you need. So when we get through this, you should have a good grounding in sort of how to think about constructing parties when you're planning what four characters you're going to bring on your Baldur's Gate 3 adventure. All right, let's get into it and start talking about how to build good parties. Now, I know you've all been waiting for this, and the important thing about jokes is that they are funnier the second time you make them, so the genesis of this video is that people have been really enjoying the full party build guides that I've been putting together. Go check those out if you haven't, they're really uh, helpful if you're trying to build a party for honor mode, and I figured that if I can teach people how to build synergistic and powerful parties themselves, then... Oh no, I messed up! Oh no! Well, too late now, I guess we just have to forge ahead. In general, I think there are four main considerations when you're building a party, although there's one overriding consideration ahead of those, which is, I think, important enough that I've put it in its own slide, and that's that D&D, Dungeons & Dragons, is an extremely flexible system with plenty of room to bend and break the rules that I'm going to lay out here. Um, this is a game that is designed for you to play the way that you want to play it. And so uh, while you can certainly optimize your party composition, the most important thing is that you bring the characters that you're interested in bringing. And I do want to emphasize that while there are definitely synergies that you can look for and things that you can... Uh, cover. This is not the type of game where you have to have every role filled in a party or you won't be able to succeed, or where you have to have every single spell, uh, important spell available or every single skill available. You can absolutely leave gaps in your party if it fits your concept or you just like specific characters or there's something that you want to accomplish in particular or have uh, very, very heavily themed parties, and those will still be fine. In fact, even from an optimization standpoint, Dungeons & Dragons falls much more heavily on the power end of the scale than on the synergy end of the scale. Uh, most game systems will either emphasize individual power of the things that you're doing, or synergy between different things that you're doing. Um, if you imagine a game where you have like two elements, each of which you can, if you have, I don't know, two cards that you have in hand, uh, a game where one of those cards does 10 damage or another game where, where each of them does one damage, but if cast together, they do 15 damage. Those are examples of games that have different emphases. So in the first one, you have very heavy emphasis on individual power level, and in the second, you have emphasis on interlocking parts. Dungeons & Dragons definitely falls more heavily towards the end of the scale that emphasizes individual power level. So it's more important overall to have individually powerful builds than it is to have a party that is extremely synergistic with one another. But of course, if you're aiming for the best possible uh, outcome, then you want to have both. I just wanted to emphasize, though, that it's very useful to, or that it's very possible to build parties that break a lot of the rules that I'm going to lay out here, and it will not make it uh, impossible for you to win, or even significantly more difficult. This is more if you want parties that do work together in the sense of uh, being able to allow you to perform how you want in combat, but also in the sense of being able to allow you to access all sorts of different content. If you want to experience more of the game, then you're going to want to have more roles and skills and everything covered, and that I think is also very important. And in the sense of it's fun when an adventuring group has really cool synergies that they can use to work together, not to mention that you will have a more powerful party if you have it be more synergistic. To do that, I think there are four things that we should consider. 
The first is roll balance. And something that I should mention here right off the top is that Dungeons & Dragons is actually quite different in how it handles roles than most other game systems. You may be familiar with MMOs or other RPGs, other party-based RPGs that have pretty strict roles like tank, healer, DPS, and, and nuker, that kind of thing. That's sort of the standard MMO role set if you've played World of Warcraft or whatever. D&D does not work like that. The roles in Dungeons & Dragons are actually significantly significantly different. So even though at sort of first glance it's the same, it looks like it's going to be the same as many other game systems, the roles that you are looking at in Dungeons and Dragons are significantly different, and I'll talk about what those actually are as we go through uh, how to balance them. But one thing that you should consider when you're building a party is how to balance the different roles and make sure that you have every role covered in your party. Another is utility coverage, which is basically a catch-all for spells and skills. There's some spells that every party should have access to, and some skills that every party should have access to, and you want to make sure that your class breakdown and build breakdown allows you to access all of those spells and skills to make sure that you have them all covered somewhere in your party. Next is item access, and there's actually two sides to item access, which is... Uh, both you want your characters not to compete for the same items. You want to make sure that your characters uh, are not overlapping too much in their gear requirements, don't need specific items in common, because then you are obviously going to have only one copy of those items and won't be able to give them to both characters that need them. But also, you want a variety of items represented because there are very powerful items that you can find in the game, and some of them are really worth building your party around having access to. I'll talk about some of the specific ones again when we get to that section, but it's worth keeping in mind that item access is both a positive and a negative requirement. You're trying to avoid conflict, but you're also trying to positively access as many powerful different uh, options as possible by making sure that your characters can use, just physically can use, as in have proficiency with or are able to access powerful item sets, but also that they uh, want to use them as part of their build, and so you want to structure your build such that those items fit into each character's um, arsenal. Finally, you want combat synergy between your characters, so you want to make sure that, that your characters actually work well together. An example of this is one character knocks an enemy prone, and the other character attacks them. If you have that that kind of internal synergy in your party, then it's something that extremely powerfully amps up what your party is capable of doing. The shared initiative system in Baldur's Gate makes this even more prevalent than in tabletop. So even though I said that D&D that &D as a system does privilege uh, raw power over synergy, Baldur's Gate makes the synergy end of the scale a little more prevalent because of the shared initiative system. If your characters roll the same initiative, you can mix and match actions between them. So if your party is reasonably well uh, set up to roll initiative uh, together, which is something that you should definitely consider, then you can have party members who have synergistic actions mix and match those actions in combat, so you get significant advantages by having your characters have access to actions that synergize with one another, like prone followed by another melee attack, or like getting an enemy covered in water followed by a lightning attack. All of those can work really well together, and you can often make entire party builds around synergizing your characters' actions together to make sure that each of them is doing something that complements what the others want to do. So let's kick things off by talking about role balance and how you're going to balance having access to different roles so your characters can fulfill different objectives during your playthrough. I've already talked about how D&D roles do not work the same way as many other video games, but how do they work? I think that characters' roles in a party can basically be measured on two axes, and importantly, it doesn't actually matter uh, what class is filling these roles. It's much more about how you build the class, what items and feats and so on you select, uh, as to how they fill these roles out. Those two axes are power versus versatility, and damage versus control. Essentially, every character in Dungeons & Dragons is going to be doing uh, some number of these two things, and you are going to 
basically need to structure your party so that you have access to both sides of each of these coins at various different times. You can do that with multiples of the same class. You can have different classes fill different sides of these two coins um, in various combinations. But in general, you're going to want to have access to raw power, as in high damage numbers, high armor class, um, high save DCs, powerful control spells that lock down groups of enemies all fall into power, the power side of the spectrum, versus versatility. So the question is, do you have the right answer for the situation, or do you have an answer that's so strong that you can use it in any situation? A good example of a very powerful character is a character that just does uh, like 100 fire damage to every enemy. That character would win almost every encounter on its own because it would just do 100 fire damage, and that's good enough to kill most enemies. But enemies uh, encounters where enemies are immune to fire or where damage isn't the solution to the problem, that character is useless. A, a more versatile character might have lots of different options, but because it's not specialized in increasing the power of each of those options... They, it's not going to reach the same raw numerical values that a more power-specialized character will have. As a very general rule, and I, I'm going to say this a lot, but I do want to specify again that this is an extreme, a very broad generalization. As a very general rule, how you should think about parties is that martial characters bring raw power and spellcasters bring versatility. The reason for this is just that spellcasters have way more buttons. When you've got 20 different spells, then you are going to have 20 options to answer any problem. Whereas martial characters tend to have one answer to the problem, and that, problem, that answer is hit it, and then hit it again really, really hard. Obviously, there are lots of ways to build characters, and Spellcasters can be skewed more towards power, martial characters can be skewed more towards versatility, but that is just sort of a general way of thinking about how uh, to bring each of these two axes, or e each side of this axis, to the uh, party as you're building it. Secondly, characters are either going to be specialized into damage or specialized into control. And control can include defensive options because, uh, in general, when you are building a Dungeons and Dragons, or when you're structuring your combat plan for D&D, you should think of it as an exercise in reducing the number of actions that your enemies take as much as possible, uh, relevant actions in particular. There are lots of ways to do that. One is just through raw damage, just killing them outright. Run one is through control spells, stopping them from acting. Another is from making their ac actions useless. So an enemy who attacks you and misses is has done just as little on their turn as an enemy who is stunned or an enemy who is dead. So all of those are options for controlling enemies' actions. Typically, your characters are going to specialize either in doing so much damage that enemies are dead before they can act, meaning that you've reduced the number of turns they are taking that way, or in controlling their actions in some way, either proactively by locking them down or reactively by preventing their actions from landing through cutting words or shield spells, stuff like that. You can, of course, combine these two effects into single into a single character. But again, in general, uh, you are going to get damage from martial characters and control from spellcasters, though, of course, these can be swapped for certain characters. I'll go over sort of which classes typically fill each of these sides of each of these coins uh, more in a second. But overall, your party should be able to bring both power and versatility, both damage and control, to a variety of situations, because you will sometimes need to vary what your answers are doing. And so in that sense, I guess, you can also skew your parties along these axes by taking different uh, party balances of characters, but you should typically strive to have access to all of these answers, whether uh, the ability to just do raw damage to solve a problem that's best, best solved through raw damage, or whether to apply control or specifically clever spells or whatever to uh, solve specific problems. Having out-of-combat solutions to problems also makes your characters more versatile, and so is something that you should definitely emphasize. As a 
Uh, and before I go to this next slide, I again want to say this is a very, very broad rule. And don't overthink this. I'm just giving you sort of a, a visual reference here for what classes are typically going to fall with sort of more standard builds along each of these axes. This is the sort of thing people tend to get really hung up on. So I do want to say, like, this is just uh, intended as a baseline. Don't overthink it. Um, but overall, your role balance here is going to be damage versus control, power versus versatility, and I've plotted each of the characters, uh, each of the classes as to where they fall on that list. Over in the extreme control and versatility side, you have wizards who have the largest spell list in the game, the most controlling spells in the game. The classic thing that wizards are supposed to do is have the right answer to a problem at the right time, and so they are as versatile as a character gets, and as control-oriented as a character gets. This isn't to say that wizards can't do damage, and in fact, all of the classes can uh, fall on the other side of the axis, like I said, depending on how you build them. But in as a general rule for wizards, you are looking to pick up control and versatility from them so that your wizard can have the right answer to a problem at the right time. You should think of a wizard as Batman with a utility belt is the sort of common analogy, and something like a paladin as Superman, whose answer to the problem is just to hit it really, really hard. He just has one or two tools, but those tools are really, really good, whereas a wizard is more has many, many tools, but individually those tools are weaker. So that gives you a good uh, sort of grounding in how to think about the characters. Wizards fall extremely far in control and versatility. Clerics are also very much on the control end, but slightly less versatile by default than wizards because um, they, they just have a smaller spell list. Druids are versatile in the sense that they are extremely versatile because they can swap between being melee characters and being spellcasters. So they have all the versatility of a spellcaster, but also the option to become a melee character. Bards are less versatile overall, but still very control-oriented, although I will say special exception for swords bards, who just get to be off the charts on all four of these scales. Um, and then you have rogues as a versatile damage-dealing class, because rogues are primarily damage, not control, but they are more intended to be versatile, filling skill access and mobility issues rather than sort of raw power in your, uh, in your party. Warlocks fall in between the damage and control axis. They do both, um, and they do both reasonably well, although not quite as well in typically as a character that's more specialized. So a warlock's damage will be a little lower than a character that's fully specialized into damage. A warlock's control will be almost as good, but will they will not always have exactly the right answer. Uh, and control does tend towards versatility, and you can see here uh, what I talked about, right? Like. Um, martial characters tend towards damage and power. Spellcasting characters tend towards control and versatility. And, war and one reason for that is that D&D control spells need to be specialized to the enemy that you're casting them against. Warlocks with few spells known won't always have exactly the right answer to a specific enemy, and so that means that they, are, they tend to be um, less easily able to pull out exactly the right spell to control an enemy at a given time. So the the Warlock's sort of lower versatility here also pulls back on its control elements a little bit. Sorcerers are less versatile. They know uh, very few spells, but very heavily scaled towards uh, power, um, but not entirely towards control because sorcerers can like double spell, so they can be more skewed towards damage. Um, and then you've got the the four sort of uh, classic martial classes, rangers, fighters, barbarians, and paladins up in the power and damage section. Fighters typically are more versatile and less um, power scaled than the others because fighters have just more options for how you can build them. They can wear heavy armor, they can use any kind of weapon, and they also tend to have some control elements with Battlemaster Fighter or with Eldritch Knight. Um, not the Eldritch Knight spells being aggressive, but remember that I said that things like shield and being able to waste enemy turns is a control element, so that's something that fighters have uh, that some of the other martial characters don't get access to. Barbarians are very heavily scaled towards damage, but a little less scaled towards raw power, because barbarians basically um, 
Rage allows you to take damage, so similarly to fighters, barbarians can spend their turn tanking, which is a control. Tanking is control, um, and so that gives them an additional dimension to their character. And rangers have a little bit of control available with entangling shots and whatever, and more if you're a beastmaster ranger, but in general are just going to be very heavily scaled towards damage and power. And then finally, paladins use smites, and paladins uh, are just entirely scaled towards power and damage. Paladins are not um, are very rest dependent, and so that also makes them slightly less versatile. They're going to do the same thing basically every turn of every combat, but the thing that they're doing is so incredibly good that it is obviously worth doing anyways. Monks are an interesting one because they're sort of a more middle-oriented class. They are uh, halfway between damage and control, a little more heavily tilted towards damage in Baldur's Gate 3 thanks to Tavern Brawler, because Tavern Brawler vastly increases monk damage compared to their tabletop counterparts, who don't get access to Tavern Brawler in the same form, um, and also thanks to Strength Elixirs giving them the ability to have massive damage output as well. And they are much more tilted towards the power end of the scale, but because of monk's extreme mobility and uh, lockdown and sort of like uh, open hand monk can trip, or three elements monk can put blocks up in play to block enemies, shadow monk can blind enemies. They do have a variety of answers to different situations, so monks are slightly more skewed towards versatility than some of the other damage dealing characters, and the fact that they fall sort of right in the middle here just gives them a really nice control element. You'll notice that monks, even though they will typically be taking the same turn over and over again, are still a more versatile character just because of their mobility and the fact that they have the, the option to do other things. Um, so I think that, that is, this is, as a general rule, how you should think about the characters and what they bring. You can look at this for sort of synergistic setups as well. For example, a paladin and a wizard make really good buddies because a wizard's going to have the right answer to the problem and a paladin will have the smite answer to the problem. I just thought of that just now and I'm very proud of it. Um, and having those two together are going to really give you a ton of different aspects to your party, whether you just need raw damage from your paladin, as well as the ability to tank another sort of... Um, uh, the, the ability to sort of lock down enemies by having uh, just decent AC, but mostly just raw damage is what paladins give you and multiple attacks. The auras that protect your allies and so on are also extremely powerful. Um, and the wizard is going to have the, the correct answer to various problems that you might face because of their vast array of spell access. Again, I do want to emphasize... It's more about how you build these classes than about the specific classes, but as a general rule, this will give you a good baseline to think about how to build characters and to think about synergies between different characters when you're constructing your party. So what does that mean when you're actually going to build a party? How should you think about these roles and how they fit into a party? Uh, people, I think, are just going to want like categories, and I think there are categories that we can really slot each character in and how they sort of fit a role and the different roles that you want to have access to in a party. There are basically, I think, three roles that are filled in a in a D and D party: controller, striker, and bruiser. And then, of course, some characters are flex characters that are intended to swap between those two roles. Like warlocks, I mentioned, can be both controllers and damage dealers. Similarly, with monks. In a typical MMO, you would have healer, tank, DPS, and nuker or controller, something along those lines. Um, but Tanks and healers don't really exist in D&D &D because dedicated tanks and healers, because the numbers just don't work out. The Those systems that have those types of classes tend to be balanced very heavily around promoting that style of gameplay by balancing incoming damage versus healing and having resource-free healing options that your healers can use regularly to uh, keep up with enemy incoming damage. There is almost no resource-free healing in Dungeons & Dragons, and the healing numbers are just not high enough to keep up with incoming damage. So dedicated healers is not, while healing can be a valuable part of your strategy, a dedicated healer is not a role that you need to have covered in your party. Similarly, a dedicated tank. Without aggro mechanics to pull enemies to attacking specific characters, except for some like AI manipulation in Baldur's Gate, and a couple very niche abilities, you just don't have access to 
uh, a dedicated tank in the same way that you would in an MMO. So I think that the way to think about these uh, characters is you should have a controller, a character whose job it is to stop enemies from doing stuff, a striker, a character whose job it is to do damage, and a bruiser, a character whose job it is to uh, fill the gaps in the line in your formation. Bruisers are really a positioning-based character, so something like a fighter that um, operates to stop enemies from going where they want to by putting themselves in the way. Bruisers are also damage dealers. So fighters, barbarians, and so on are also damage dealers. And that's why I think that it is worth keeping in mind that those, while they aren't specifically strikers whose job is just to output damage, they have a different strategic consideration. That's their main consideration. Um, bruisers are also typically more damage focused in Dungeons and Dragons. Finally, you have characters that are built to do both or fill multiple roles at different times. A typical example of this is a monk or a warlock whose job is to drop down one spell and then swap to being a striker by firing off eldritch blasts, or a monk whose job is to be both a striker and a controller at the same time by doing a bunch of damage and landing stunning strikes. In general, um, you're going to want one of each of these three roles and a flex character in a party. I think that that is just a very solid way to think about building a party, and that will give you the option to emphasize one of these three roles more based on what you have your flex character doing in the party while having three characters who are specialized into these three roles um, in order to fill the all the strategic considerations that you need filled at any given time. Obviously, there are lots of parties you can build that don't fill all of these roles or have uh, different setups, but that is a good rule for a default party build, and I think is how you should think about your characters as you're building them. Is this going to be a controller character? Is this going to be a striker? And then that gives you a sense of what you should be emphasizing when you're looking for items. Controllers need save DC items, um, and they need to have like high initiative so they can go before enemies and stop them from acting. Strikers obviously just need raw damage, and bruisers need health and damage to both draw threat and also survive enemy attacks. Um, and also when you're actually building the character, what spells should you take, what feats should you take, what... Um, items should you take? What sort of uh, weapons should you build your character around? So if you sort of have this idea in mind when you go to construct a build of what role it's going to fill in the party, you're going to have a much easier time constructing powerful builds that are also synergistic with one another. All right, that basically covers role balance. Now let's talk about what utilities your party needs to have covered. We're going to talk about specific spells that I think basically every party should have and specific skills that your party is going to need to cover. Um, I will mention at this point that if you're enjoying the video, it's super helpful if you leave a comment. So in keeping with the theme of the video, just tell me, I don't know, your favorite dad joke in the comments. I'd appreciate that very much. All right, let's talk about utility coverage because not everything is about combat power. Your party also needs to be able to succeed out of combat and bring powerful utility spells that help in combat as well. I think there are basically three things that you need to cover in terms of utilities for your party. Conversation skills, non-conversation skills, and a list of utility spells. In a Dungeons and Dragons party, if you were playing tabletop, you would want to have every skill covered. Um, as much as possible. Obviously, you won't be able to cover all of them in most parties, but as much as possible, you'd like to have at least one character who can make every skill check. That's less true in Baldur's Gate 3 because certain skills are redundant or not uh, used very frequently, and you also have to care more about which character has which skill than you would in a typ typical tabletop game because of the rules of Baldur's Gate 3. This comes up most when you're trying to cover conversation skills, and I think skills more or less come in two kinds, conversation skills and non-conversation skills. Because of of Baldur's Gate 3's rule, where only one character can participate in a conversation at a time, so only one character can be making skill checks, it's heavily incentivized for you to have one character cover all of your conversation skills. 
your non-conversation skills don't have to all be on the same character. But when you're planning your party, you should typically plan to have one character that's going to be your party face, the character that does all of your talking, and covers as many of the conversation skills as is feasible. The conversation skills are all of the charisma-based skills, as you'd expect, but also all of the intelligence-based skills, which are almost always used during conversations, and insight um, as a wisdom-based skill. Medicine is also almost always used in conversation, so if you can get that on your um, conversation character, on your party face, then that helps as well. Usually you're going to want in any given Baldur's Gate party to have one, at least one of, probably two of the charisma skills covered. Uh, persuasion is the best, you can refer to my skills tier list for more on that, but Overall, I think it is just most important that you stack as many conversation skills as possible onto one character so that that character can cover them. It's not important that you have them covered across multiple characters, and so you can ignore conversation skills on all three of your other characters uh, completely, because only one character can participate in combat at a uh, com in combat, in conversation at a time, so only one character is going to ever be rolling these checks if they're the one you start conversations with. You, for your non-conversation skills, you can have them on anybody. It doesn't matter if these are all on the same character, and it doesn't matter if they're all on the conversation character as well. You can just have one character do all of your skills, if they're a bard is usually when that happens, but it's possible with rogues and stuff as well. Um, and that's a totally reasonable way to build it, or you can have your non-conversation skills spread out across the rest of your party. The really important ones here are sleight of hand, which is used to steal things, open locks, disarm traps. Every party needs access to sleight of hand. I think that's basically mandatory for Baldur's Gate. The game gets a lot harder if you don't have sleight of hand somewhere in your party. And perception. Perception is used for finding um, traps, and so is incredibly valuable to have as well. If you can have these on the same character, it's a small advantage, because then your character that sees the trap can also disarm it, but it's not required, and so mostly what you're trying to do is stack all your conversation skills on one character, and then get sleight of hand and perception anywhere in your party, and you'll be covered for skills. For utility spells, I've there's a bunch of utility spells that I think every party should have access to, and so I've listed those out here. Uh, this is not a comprehensive list, and it is in rough order of importance, but I think that there are um, essentially seven spells that you're really going to want to have access to in a party. A lot of these you can duplicate through scrolls or items, so you don't necessarily need to have all of them known as spells, but it is helpful if you have characters that can learn these. Longstrider is great because it just improves your entire party's movement speed by 10, which is an incredibly powerful utility effect, and it's resource-free to use it, so that is awesome. You usually want two copies of Guidance in your party, because sometimes the character that has Guidance will want to be using another reaction to that role, um, so it's helpful to have an ally who also has Guidance. One of these can be from an item, but usually you should try to have Guidance known on it on at least one character, and having two copies of it is very helpful so that you can always roll that. You can always cast Guidance and Enhance Ability if you, or and Bardic Inspiration or whatever if you really want to pass a skill check. Minor Illusion is one of the best spells in the, in the game and lets you reposition enemies, stealth, steal things, just incredible. Resistance is super useful for a couple encounters and a couple dialogue encounters like story events. So Resistance gives you bonus to saving throws on those and is very valuable. Somewhere in your party you need a magical light source. It doesn't have to be magical, but it's very helpful if it is. So light or dancing lights um, or daylight, I guess, but ideally you want one that's resource free. Every party can use invisibility, so you should try to have access to that somehow, though again, you can do that through scrolls or potions. And finally, Create Water is just an incredible utility spell that every party should try to have access to somewhere in the party as well. None of these are mandatory, although I think you're giving up a lot of power if you don't have Longstrider and Guidance, but um, I think that this will be a good list of spells that you should really try to work into every party build, because it will just make your gameplay much, much smoother. Other than that, the spell coverage and skill coverage, I think you can really get away with a lot of different setups, and these are kind of the baselines from which most parties want to be working off of, but um, these rules are somewhat flexible. Next up, items. I think this is where a lot of people get kind of in their heads, because 
you will often see people uh, giving strident advice about not having your items overlap or anything like that. And there's a lot of YouTube videos like you need to make absolutely certain that your characters don't need the same item. And I think that can be a little intimidating, but it's actually pretty easy to stop your characters from competing for items if you follow a couple very, very simple rules. You definitely do not need to plan all your characters' items in advance. You do not need to memorize every item that's available in the game. There are a couple specific items that are worth considering, especially for honor mode when you're putting together a party, but for the most part you can just plan around general rules and you will have a very easy time keeping your character from conflicting with items. So let's talk about what actually matters when it comes to trying to keep your characters from having uh, too many of the same item requirements. The first is armor types. In Baldur's Gate, there, well, in Dungeons and Dragons, there are four types of armor. Heavy armor, medium armor, light armor, and no armor, or unarmored characters. And you do usually want to avoid having more than two characters that want the same armor type. This will help you avoid having to use, like, your third best suit of armor of that type, because overall you are going to collect a lot of armor over the course of your playthrough. You will almost always have a great second set of armor, that you can use if two characters use the same set of armor, but sometimes your third set of armor will be a little out of date or will take a lot of money that you don't have in order to get from a merchant or something like that. And so it's generally speaking best to try to avoid having more than two characters that use the same type of armor. Uh, the kind of ideal would be that your party actually wanted one character who wants each armor type. You would have a heavy armor user, a medium armor user, a light armor user, and an unarmored user. Um, but Baldur's Gate is definitely generous enough with armors that you do not need to fill that uh, exact setup in order to have great armor on your characters. Something that's, uh, else that's worth mentioning is that there are tons of shields, so you do not need to worry about having multiple shield users. There are plenty of great shields that will stay good on all the way into the end game, and even a non-magical shield is just plus two AC, so even if you get stuck without a good without a uh, magical shield or a shield with a really powerful effect, a non-magical shield is just a great item. So you don't really have to worry too much. You can have four characters who want to be using shields, and that will not cause a conflict in your party. Something to keep in mind when you're doing armor, or talking about armor or just defenses in general when and when you're thinking about a party, is that it's good just to have really strong defenses on every character because your party's... Uh, AC and their defenses are only as strong as the weakest link. Having three characters with 30 AC and one character with 15, those three characters with 30 AC might as well be naked because the, all the enemy attacks will go against the character with 15 AC. So it's less important that uh, one character has super high AC and more important that you have decent armor class across the board, decent saving throws across the board or immunities or whatever. Just a general rule when you're thinking about party defenses is that you're only as strong as the weakest link when it comes to defenses. Weapon types are a little stricter, and I think you should try to avoid having two characters that want exactly the same weapon type. Um, like two-handers, one-handers, two-handers are, uh, there's enough of them that you can have multiple two-handed users. Um, but in, in general, if you have characters that want like light finesse, uh, one-handed weapons, you are going to want to only have one character that does that, because maybe they'll want two of those weapons, and so equipping uh, two characters with four of those weapons can actually stretch your resources. Obviously, if you're a more advanced player, you've memorized your route, you know exactly what weapons your characters are going to be equipped with, then you don't have to... You, you won't need to worry about that, but for a general rule for most players, you're going to want to avoid having multiple characters that use exactly the same type of weapon. This, I think, is especially prevalent for bows, because Baldur's Gate is actually surprisingly stingy with good bows. Um, in fact, there's only a couple that are like late game viable, and so having multiple archers can actually really stretch your uh, your access to bows. Hand crossbows are even worse because your character needs two of them, and there aren't really that many good ones in the first place, so having multiple hand crossbow users would really stress your resources. Again, this isn't uh, non-viable or impossible to build around or anything like that, but just as a general rule, you'll find it easier if your characters aren't competing for specific weapon types. Next, attribute items. There's a few items that increase your attributes, and you do want, and, and 
uh, they're all unique. They're all items that will have, or almost all of them are unique. So they're items that you'll only have one copy of. And these are often items that you're going to build entire builds around. So you should account for who's going to be wearing them, if anyone in your party from the beginning, so that you don't get partway in and find that you have two builds that need a specific attribute item. And finally, specific items that you have in mind. Obviously, if you have one character who's planning to use a specific item, then the other characters won't want to use that. But it's also good to have a character who can use certain specific items, because those items are so powerful that it's worth building a character who's intended to use that. Like I said right at the beginning, item access is both positive and negative. You want to avoid conflict, but you also want to build characters who are capable of using specific powerful items so that you can bring that level of power into your party. Let's talk a little bit more about the attribute items and the specific items because those are items that are actually named in the game and so it's worth just mentioning which of those you should be planning around. For attribute items, there are four, I think, that really matter and that you should try to avoid having conflict on. There's more, but those come very late in the game, and so you won't usually be making builds around them, or if you are, you'll already have them and sort of be uh, building in the very late game. Those are Ethel's Hair, which is available through a story event and gives you one in any attribute. A lot of builds get way better if you have... Uh, that to even out odd numbers, to give you access to 20 in a stat without having to spend two ASIs on it, and so on. And so only one character can use it. Um, but And if you're building a character that has an odd number and wants it, you should definitely try to avoid having that on other characters. The Circlet of Intelligence, which gives you 17 intelligence. This is There's not a lot of characters that really want the Circlet of Intelligence, but obviously you only get one copy, so if you're building around it, you need to uh, make sure that you aren't building two builds that need it. The Gloves of Dexterity, which set your dexterity to 18 and are core to a ton of builds, because they enable so many different builds since they let you um, basically max out your dexterity without having to spend any ASIs on it. So you can have super high dexterity on a character that would normally dump dexterity, or have super high dexterity on a dexterity-based character and have them take a bunch of feats instead of ASIs. The Gloves of Dexter are the ones that are going to be most in demand across most parties and will cause the most conflict, and I think those are the ones that you really should plan around from the beginning, who, if anyone, is going to wear the gloves. Finally, there are Strength Elixirs that set your strength to 20, or technically 21, but it's the same. Um, and these are infinite. You can have as many of them as you're willing to uh, long rest for and then go rebuy from the merchants um, as long as you continue to have like food and stuff. But you can scum that too if you just really want to have infinite elixirs of strength. My recommendation, just for fun purposes, is don't have more than one character who's reliant on the strength elixirs just because it can get pretty annoying having to... Um, make sure that you are acquiring those every day to keep your characters in their drugs. Uh, but obviously, there are infinite of these in the game, so you can build more than one character that's, that requires them. It's just important to know in advance that you're going to need them so you can stockpile them from the merchants who have them. Next up are specific item sets that are worth thinking about for every honor mode party, and I'm mostly specifically thinking of honor mode parties here, but uh, these are all valuable for any party. First up, there's the buff on heal set of items. This is a powerful set of items that give you Blade Ward and Bless on heal. You can check basically any of my cleric guides for more information on these guys. Um, and this is such a powerful effect and such a powerful item set that you really should think about who is going to have it in your party, uh, if anybody, and you don't want multiple characters who want it, but you should have a character who's built to take advantage of it because it's so incredibly strong. Arcane Acuity and Radiant Orbs I have marked with asterisks. These are pretty important if you're just trying to win honor mode. These are some of the most powerful effects in the game, and you should know which character is going to be triggering those. Um, but then as more general rules, you don't want too many characters that want save DC increasing items, so spellcasters who are casting spells that enemies will be making saving throws against, because there's a limited number of these in the game. There's a lot, but a limited number. Um, and so if you have too many controlling characters who rely on save DC items to get their save DCs high or just want them, then it's going to create some tension in your party. 
Initiative items are super important for some builds that otherwise can't get adequate initiatives, and initiative winning initiative is incredibly important, so you want high initiative on every character in your party as much as possible. Some of that you can get through items, but if you build a lot of low initiative characters, then those items will be too in demand and you won't be able to get adequate initiative on your party as a whole. Throne weapons, weapons with the throne and returning property, um, are pretty in demand. So if you have multiple characters who care about throwing weapons, there's only one that you can throw and return for most of the game, uh, the returning pike. So you shouldn't build multiple characters that need that weapon. And critical hit items. There's a lot to builds that benefit very strongly from improved critical hit chance, like paladins, like rogues, um, like warlocks who are centered around fear builds, things like that. All of those will want a lot of critical hit items, and so you should try to avoid having too many builds that have those items in demand. I think if you think of these seven types of items when you're structuring your party and think, who's going to get this, who's going to get this, and again, I want to emphasize this is only for honor mode. If you are not playing on honor mode, you really do not need to put in even this much thought into it. Uh, just think about the armor class and you'll be good to go. Um, but these specific items are worth thinking about to, to push your honor mode playthrough into a higher power state because you're going to be able to uh, have your characters either not need or get to use some of the most powerful items in the game. So just to sum up the item access rules, I think that what you really need to focus on with items when you are trying to build your party is try not to have more than two characters that need the same type of armor and try not to have more than one character that needs exactly the same kind of weapon. Other than that, I think you are very free to do whatever because the game is very generous with loot. You get enough loot to equip multiple parties like many times over with excellent gear. And so you really are not going to get yourself into a situation where you are too choked on gear um, if you just avoid having too many characters that need exactly the same specific types of armor and weapons. And if you really want to step things up and optimize your builds a little further, then you can think about these specific items or item sets in order to optimize which character is going to get access to those. Next up, I'm going to talk about some example parties, um, because obviously we want in this build to have some example parties where we put everything together at the end. I will also say I mentioned as a fourth consideration for your party combat synergies, how you should build around specific combat synergies for your party, but I'm going to cop out a little on talking about those and say that they are uh, just too deep a topic and there's too many of them, and so to get more information about combat synergies, go watch the videos where I build parties around specific combat Combat synergies because those are going to talk about specific combat synergies and how you can exploit them. I've already posted one where we build around the wet condition which doubles cold and lightning damage and so applying that and exploiting it is the whole theme of the party. You can find that under the best blaster party in Baldur's Gate 3 and more will definitely be upcoming to talk about specific um, combat synergies that you can have in your party. Uh, I think that if I tried to cover it in this video this video would just be six hours long so we're going to do that in future future installments. All right, let's get some example parties going. So I've put together three example parties, just different combinations of classes, and we'll talk about how you could fill the roles and requirements that I've talked about as I go through each of them. We'll start with the classic party, which you'll notice is exactly the same composition as in my video, the best party in Baldur's Gate 3, which I think is a great default party for playing through honor mode. We've got a fighter, a bard, a cleric, and a wizard here. Um, which fills sort of the, the pretty standard composition that you would expect from a Dungeons & Dragons game. You might expect a rogue instead of a bard in sort of the very typical classic party, but I think that bard fits better because in Baldur's Gate, you really need one character to have all your conversation skills, and of course that's going to be the bard. In this party, we have the, the fighter as a bruiser, the bard as a striker and controller flex character, the cleric as a bruiser and controller flex character, and the wizard as a pure controller is sort of the standard way to set that up. Although in the video that I actually put together with this party, we do something completely different, which is uh, one of the things that's really interesting about this type of party build is that you can have different classes fulfill completely different roles. In fact, in that video, we have the fighter as the striker, just a pure striker, the bard as a striker controller flex, the 
Cleric as a bruiser controller flex, and the wizard also as a bruiser controller flex because of how we have chosen our classes and how we set up those characters. Obviously, you can watch that video for a more in-depth breakdown. This combination gives us great skill access because we have the bard who just gets every skill, um, and great utility access because on our between our wizard and our cleric, we have access to all of the uh, powerful spells that we need. Um, getting access to every one of the utility spells that I mentioned. We also use all of our items extremely well. The Bard can use Arcane Acuity, the Wizard and Cleric can use Save DC items, they can all use um, Initiative, and we also don't conflict at all for our armor. In the, the default way that you would set up this party, you would have the Fighter in Heavy Armor, the Bard in Light Armor, the Cleric in Medium Armor, and the Wizard in No Armor, although you can have depending on your subclass selection, multiple medium armors or multiple heavy armors, if you want to change up what your characters are wearing. But the way that this party is set up gives you a significant amount of flexibility to avoid conflict with armor, covers every skill, covers every role, gives you access to both versatility and power, both damage and control, all in a single package. Then I've done a twist on that, where we just take a, a party that has a very similar concept, but using different classes, because I want to emphasize that you can fill these roles with different classes, depending on how you structure it. Also, it's kind of fun that this is the same party composition as the second video I posted, the best blaster party in Baldur's Gate 3, although in that video, the rogue and the barbarian are combined into a single character, and we also added in a cleric. But in this party. We have damage and power from our Barbarian, we have versatility from our Druid, we have versatility and damage from our Rogue, and we have power and control from our Sorcerer. So we're hitting all of the the axes very well. We have a Striker in our Rogue, we have a Bruiser in our Barbarian, we have a Controller in our Sorcerer, and we have a character that can flex between all three in our Druid. So we've got all the roles covered. Again, we have no armor, uh, light armor, and then in this case we have two medium armors, but that's not an issue, and we aren't using any weapons that uh, are in common because the rogue wants finesse weapons, the barbarian probably wants heavy weapons or maybe thrown weapons, the druid wants no weapons, and the sorcerer wants staves, uh, staves. So that is a thing. So that party will also have no conflicts, uses all the items extremely well, and covers every skill. The sorcerer is going to cover your conversation skills, and the rogue is going to cover your non-conversation skills, although the rogue could also be your party face if that's something that you wanted. Finally, I wanted to show off just like one more party that's sort of more themed around a specific playstyle, and this party is themed around overwhelming initial damage, but still fills all of the roles, because this uh, party is sort of more geared towards power than it is towards versatility, but we have some fairly flexible characters, and this party is going to be sort of trending more towards the power end of the spectrum and more towards the damage end of the spectrum, but we still have control from the monk, we have control from the warlock, we get a little bit of control from the ranger, and then we have uh, two strikers in the paladin and ranger, and two controllers in the monk and warlock. The paladin also fills the bruiser end of the spectrum, uh, and the Monk can sort of flex as a bruiser if you need to as well. So all of these parties do all of the, the roles that we need. In this case, it's going to be the Warlock filling conversation skills and the Ranger filling out of conversation skills, just to sort of tie off the skill access. Uh, monk needs no armor, Warlock needs light, Ranger needs medium, Paladin needs heavy. So you can see that the parties naturally fall into scenarios where you aren't going to come into conflict for items, um, even if you build a more heavily themed party Party around a specific goal. So you can, you have a lot of room to tilt your party in one direction or another, depending on what you're trying to do, um, based on the, uh, the goals that you have for that playthrough without running into conflict with your party. All right, my friends, I hope that this has been helpful and you've enjoyed this look at how to make powerful and synergistic parties and that these example parties maybe give you some inspiration for how you want to do your next playthrough. Um, as always, if there are things that you think I missed or things that I should change, definitely let me know in the comments. And of course, if you've enjoyed the video, then it helps me out a ton if you hit like and leave a comment. Uh, YouTube does care a lot about those things for the algorithm. And again, 
um, I've mentioned this before, but whenever I try sort of new and different content like this, that's one of the things that will tend to show up for new viewers. So it's one of the things that's most likely to just like get new people to stumble on the channel. So if you do an engagement push on this video, I would really appreciate it because it helps out a lot when new people see this kind of thing and decide they like our, our stuff and want to hang out with all of us. Um, and of course, you can subscribe to my channel for more of this and other strategy game content. And if you've really enjoyed the video, you can feel free to support me with the buttons below, though, of course, no obligation. All right, cheers, my friends, and thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.